Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is Concepts Lecture 13 on Skill and Deskilling. I'm going to talk first about some lost skills. Skills are what people used to learn in art academies. Since the Second World War, more or less, there's been an emphasis on deconstructing skills in order to make more innovative art. This is actually an idea that first began in places like uh, the Bauhaus, which was interested in uh, erasing the bad muscular memory and bad mental memory of previous academic skills. But de-skilling, as it's called, really only got underway after the Second World War and especially after the 60s and 70s. Some skills have been deconstructed in the sense that they've been reimagined and are taught completely differently, and others have just been abandoned. The result is that many BFA and MFA programs have dropped instructions in a number of traditional skills. So there is now a pretty long list of things that aren't taught in art schools. So here are some of them, just to start. Engraving. as in metal engraving. Uh, this was one of the major skills up until the beginning of the 20th century, uh, actually, and it's been replaced in printmaking by etching and lino cut. So um, work like you see on the right uh, would have been very typical in uh, paper money and in newspaper illustrations and in prints and in postage stamps and all sorts of things like that up through the end of the 19th century. But the skills to do that um, are lost um, and uh, metal engraving in general is not taught uh, because it's, it's easier and less systematic um, to teach uh, etching or lino cut and other forms of uh, woodcut and things like that instead. And there's also wood engraving. My name's Chris Wormel and I'm an artist and illustrator. Among the things I do are wood engravings and that was the thing that really got me started as an illustrator. I used to make wood engravings, I still do. And I was inspired by an artist called Thomas Buick, who was the guy who really sort of invented wood engraving almost, way back in the early 19th century. Buick was a brilliant naturalist, and so all the pictures are really, really incredibly accurate. Woodcuts and wood engravings are the same in that they're both uh, relief printing, like liner cutting. You might have done liner cutting at school, or in its very crudest form, potato printing. Here we are, wood block. The sort of subject that Buick probably would have done. Almost feeling, almost feeling the wind blowing, I always think. It sort of grows as grass grows, really. That's what also... Yeah, he gets a bit carried away, but it's a very interesting art. Um, and it, up until recently, you could still uh, learn that because there was a company right near Chicago that sold wood engraving tools and the special wood that they used. You may have noticed that, that in the blocks that they use, the tools are so fine and the wood is so hard that you actually can't feel the relief with your fingers at all. So it's not at all like, um, like lino cuts and things like that, despite the fact that the, they're both intaglio printing, as he said. Another skill that's largely lost is what's called bon fresco, true fresco, because in order to do that, um, you need to have a source of lime, uh, which has been heated to 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there was a time when several uh, schools in North America taught this. The museum school in Boston used to teach this, um, real fresco painting. Um, we've done it here at the School of the Art Institute a couple times, um, that, but it wasn't actual bone fresco because you can simulate it without heating up the lime. But basically to paint onto rock is what you end up doing. Um, to do it in the real Italian way, um, you need that heated lime and lots and lots of other materials. Um, so that's also not taught. Perspective is a lost skill. Uh, it is sometimes taught. It's not taught in, it's not required the way it used to be um, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries in art academies then. Um, but when it is taught, it's really only the rudiments of it. Um, in the past, artists learned uh, really detailed architectural perspective um, and sciography. Sciography is pretty much a lost art. It's the technique for drawing shadows. You can, um, if you do, for example, an architectural illustration, um, you can, um, using sciography, you can cast the shadows as they would appear at any time of day 
for any place, for any place in the world. All of perspective, including sciography, has been taken over by computers, and as a result, um, these things are automated and nobody knows how to do them. So if you were asked to draw the shadow of a cone on a cylinder, which is what you see at the top there, you wouldn't be able to do it without special training. Um, but of course you could do it with, uh, with a little bit of training, in comparatively speaking, um, in a CAD CAM program, in a, uh, in a program on a computer. Classical bronze investment is taught, but in a simplified version. Classical bronze investment was done by a number of cultures and in India and China and other places of the world, um, and um, in the West, uh, in, ancient, in Rome and Greece, and then also um, in the Renaissance. The original classical bronze investment is, uh, is a complicated technique, and there's a simplified one that gets called classical investment uh, that is taught in a number of art schools that have foundries. Um, so this is this is close. It's not a vanished art, but it's close to vanishing. Marble carving. That was part of a longer video that you could get on YouTube that marble carving using traditional tools as opposed to um, air drills um, is basically not taught here. You can learn it in some parts of the world. There are, uh, specialized, um, there are specialized places in Florence and elsewhere where um, carvings that are like replicas of the Michelangelo David are made for wealthy patrons around the world and they use traditional tools because they're paid to use them. Um, so it does exist. Uh, there's, there are a couple of people in Chicago who can do that kind of thing, um, who have uh, done work on different cathedrals and uh, Tribune Tower and things like that that have stone ornaments that are carved. But marble carving, even though that video made it look uh, pretty tedious, actually is really um, interesting and, goes, and can go quite quickly uh, because marble is soft. It's a tiny bit like wood, so it's actually a very interesting art. Right, so mosaic. Um, you can practice mosaic anywhere, but to do a, a real mosaic, you need uh, an extensive collection of tesserae. Um, one of the places that used to do that in, in the States was the Boston Museum School. They had a collection of tesserae. I'm not sure if they still do or not. Nowadays, it's mostly just taught for conservation, like in this case, conserving, um, conserving Roman mosaics. Industrial design materials. Um, it's been a cliche among people who talk about skilling and de-skilling that an, uh, very few artists could actually make a toaster if you set out to make a toaster because toaster has all sorts of things in it, like in this case, um, enameled, uh, enameled uh, um, uh, coatings on metal and all kinds of other, um, all kinds of other materials go into a toaster um, that basically are not taught at art schools. And art schools um, have this interesting kind of like um, split personality uh, thing going on where you have on the one hand high-tech stuff so you might have AI and you have VR and you have robotics and all kinds of things like that on the other hand in terms of media you have ceramics and you have wood and you have metal but you don't have all the other things that industrialized societies have like the things that go into a toaster ceramics is another example because ceramics uh, in art schools almost completely bypasses the chemistry of ceramics I have a close-up of the space shuttle here because um, in, in Alfred, New York, where, where is one of the world's uh, foremost uh, places to study ceramics and art, right up the road from the school, they have uh, one of the places where they used to make the ceramic tiles for the space shuttle that contracted to NASA. And the chemistry of ceramics is way outside the understanding of most people who do ceramics. The, the only exception there is that some people are really into the chemistry of glazes. So you do get in... Um, and SICA, which is the National Ceramics Conference, you do get, uh, like, a, uh, there's a faction of people there who really know their chemistry of glazes. Um, but beyond that, uh, you wouldn't get as far as these kind of ceramics. You wouldn't, uh, that's, that's not something that most of the time the world of ceramics is um, connected to. You can make your own connections, of course, and many artists have, uh, but this is not something that's traditionally taught. The most important of these lost skills is traditional academic drawing. Uh, there are many different modernist techniques of drawing that are still taught, but academic drawing, as it was taught in the academies from the 16th to the 19th century or so, is a lost art, uh, including among teachers. 
it's always important not to assume that your teachers actually know lots and lots of things about these techniques and skills from past centuries, because usually they don't. So I'll give a longer example of this. Michelangelo made what used to be called a cartoon, which means, which meant a life-size drawing that was intended to help him to make a large painting of a battle, the Battle of Kashina. He never finished the painting, but he did finish the cartoon, so he had a wall-sized drawing, a cartoon. And that became so famous that uh, it attracted so many artists um, to come to um, Florence to trace it that they actually destroyed it by tracing it. So the only thing that survives of this particular project of Michelangelo's are the drawings for the cartoon, like this one. And these would be like 12 or 14 inches high. These are regular sized drawings, not wall sized drawings. And even these drawings were very influential, especially on the development of European academies of art. So what you see in these drawings is actually the prototype or the model for academic drawing as it was practiced from the end of the Renaissance all the way up through to the end of the 19th century and in, in, in more conservative academies um, all the way to the present. When you first look at these drawings, um, unfinished parts look uh, spontaneous. They look like they don't have any particular system to it. But there are actually is four systems in these drawings. And systems are important because systems are what can be taught. They're systematic, um, so that they, they, they lend themselves to, um, to pedagogy, to studio teaching. So I'll just uh, mention these four. First system was light and shade. So one of the uh, later academic ways of naming the three components of light and shade is using these words shadow, what's called umbra, light, lumen, and then a line between them was called tonos. So everybody who draws knows about light and shadow, but this idea of tonos um, isn't taught anymore. Here's the tonos in this drawing. It's a darker line, which actually doesn't exist in nature, but it helps to articulate the drawing. So it's part of the system of drawing. Second system was hatching. So hatching works in three stages. The overall shadow, in this case of the thigh, is done in what's called single hatching. And these words again, like, the, like lumen, umbra, and tonos, these are later words, not words that Michelangelo would have used, but, but this is the practice um, that, he was, that he had. So single hatching was for the overall shadow. Then it was covered with lines at about 60 degrees, which later called cross hatching. And then if he needed more darkness, he could finish with lines at 120 degrees. That's double hatching. Third system was outlines. Outlines were done in a very particular way in, drawing, in these drawings and then in the academic practice of the next couple centuries that followed Michelangelo. They were called contorni in Italian, contours. They were systematic. They were braided along the outline with one another, like this. And they were drawn in several different distinct darknesses. So the idea was nothing was erased. These were all on top of each other, and they together produced the three-dimensional effect of some of these outlines. They produced the effect of looking around the edge, which you're always trying to do when you're first practicing um, drawing. And the fourth system was curved hatching. So Michelangelo started hatch marks about 60 degrees from each other, like that. But then as they went down the limb, they would turn so that they flowed with the limb, with the contour of the limb, like that. So they would be plural, they would be parallel to the contorni. And here's another example of that. Hatch marks turning so that they follow the contour. Michelangelo even manages to imply a tonos, that is the border between the light and shade of these contour lines. And that's because he begins and ends these lines so carefully. That's definitely a skill. That's really hard to learn. When you, if you're interested in practicing hatching, you might want to try this. Start and end your hatch lines so evenly so that you could draw in your imagination lines like this. So similar systems of hatching and tonos and so on were taught to all art students before modernism. And they appear in other media, like this in metal engraving that I showed before. And by the way, notice the skill level of this. It's a really artificial, geometric looking thing when you look at the eye magnified. But if you look at the little one, in other words, if you look at it the way you would have seen it on a print, on an art print, or in a bank note, or on a, on a postage stamp, then um, it comes together in a pretty amazing way. 
a very high skill level there. From the beginning of academies in Europe up to the 20th century, there were no classes in painting, sculpture, or other arts in academies. As an art student, you would only learn drawing. And I'm going to say something about this at the end of the history lectures, if you're interested. The last couple of those lectures have to do with this. So my second and last subject then is the theory, uh, that's a theory and theory of de-skilling, the theory and the history of de-skilling. Here's the chart by the Belgian art historian Thierry de Duve, um, which I have also in several other lectures because it's a very useful chart. Um, and he distinguishes three different periods in art education. Uh, so on the left, the early 19th century academy, and then the Bauhaus, modernist German academy, and then contemporary art schools. And then on the chart, he traces the evolution of uh, concepts through time so the one that I'm interested in here is the one on the left-hand um, column, talent, creativity, and attitude. And then comes skill, medium, and practice, and then imitation, invention, and deconstruction. So in different lectures, I'm going to come back to all of these at, at one or another point. And I think also in lecture H27, but just at the moment, want to focus on this middle column. So here it is in a easier to read form. So the idea here is that you would have learned skills in what he calls the 19th century academy, um, which I would rather say is just academies from Michelangelo's day all the way up to modernism, but he calls it the 19th century academy. Um, skill is technique and metier, which is a French word that's, that's used also to mean profession professional skill, professional specialization. And you also would have learned things like canons of beauty, but we don't need to, we don't need to get into that here. But skill in particular is, uh, would have been one of the main things that you learned in, um, in academies. And then in uh, modernist academies like the Bauhaus, attention shifted to medium. So you'd be, you'd be taught different media. And that meant because you were interested in interrogating media and understanding different media, some skills would drop out, you wouldn't need them all. In the current condition, as de Duve calls it, um, medium is also questioned. So he calls the current condition practice, and that I'm going to develop in another lecture. So again, not something that we need to look at here. But in terms of skill, what's happened is that skill has been doubly lost. It's been lost once in, in modernism by concentrating on media, medium, medium specificity. And then it's been lost again in, quote, the current condition, which means basically after uh, mid 20th century, after the Second World War, uh, because of the interest in practice. So you would have been taught in those uh, 19th century academies, technique, metier, and also aesthetics. And all three of them were more or less left behind uh, in modernist academies like the Bauhaus. Uh, modernist academies introduced a whole lot of new media, and so in a sense there also wasn't time for all the traditional skills, and the new media also brought with them new kinds of skills, so it wasn't as if all skill suddenly uh, disappeared. But instead of stressing skill, modernist academies encouraged their students to experiment with media, to question them. So for example, you would be taught to use brushes and, and chisels and so on in unskilled or inappropriate ways, so this was, um, this modernist moment was, um, did involve skills and even some new skills, but it was also all about questioning your skills in order to question the medium itself. And then the word practice, um, which we're gonna study in uh, lecture 14, became uh, the commonplace um, uh, guiding idea. And Deduve thinks that that's a result of rebelling against the restrictions of medium, but also failing to bring back the skills of the early period. Practice, in his way of thinking, is also kind of lost place where we've ended. Uh, so he's very, well, he's very pessimistic, um, and I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, uh, that kind of derogatory idea of practice, but that's for another lecture. So since the 1960s, art schools and academies have pretty comprehensively de-skilled. So there are many fewer skills in the 21st century in art schools and academies than there were even 50 years ago. And this mean, means that students who bring skills with them 
will probably be encouraged to forget those skills in order to be able to question media or to question their practice. I've, uh, I've seen, I've been on admissions committees where I've seen um, MFA, uh, candidates for MFA programs uh, be turned down because they have um, too high a level of skill in certain media, usually it's drawing or painting, um, and the idea of that, of rejecting a student like that, is basically that sometimes it can seem as if such a student cannot be de-skilled. In other words, you can't rid them of the habits that they've learned, um, usually realistic academic style habits. If those habits are really strong and they've been around for a long time, um, that student effectively is not teachable if by teaching you mean um, radical de-skilling and interrogation of um, existing customs and habits. One of the books on this subject was edited at the School of the Art Institute. It's called What Do Artists Know? And you could get uh, more information about all this in that. Howard Singerman is an historian who wrote the first book on this subject called Art Subjects. He wrote it because he got an MFA in sculpture. And then after he graduated, he realized that he didn't have the basic skill of casting, a basic skill of sculpture. So his question was, Okay, what did I learn? What is my MFA? What did I learn in my de-skilled school? Um, and his answer is interesting and complicated. More or less, it's like this. You learn in an MFA program, in this case, how to understand the conditions of contemporary art and how to talk about the historical and critical conditions of practice without skill or medium. In other words, you're learning to um, reflect on your historical moment, which is a moment when art doesn't depend on skill and even anymore depend on medium. De-skilling has become practically invisible. It used to be very widely debated, especially because, you know, conservative um, faculty members, for example, wanted to continue teaching the specific skills. But now those older skills are largely forgotten and there are a lot of new ones in their place. And I have a little list there, just you know, programming languages and, and applications and things like that would be examples of skills that have gone in place of the old ones. And there's remarkably little discussion uh, on this anymore, on de-skilling, on what needs to be taught. Singerman says in his book, quote, it's not that we have nothing to teach, but rather that given the art of the recent past, there is no particular thing that needs to be learned. We have no idea what skills, traditional or otherwise, should be taught because there's no longer any skill whose mastery is tantamount to making art. For some people, it's a really depressing conclusion. For other people, it doesn't really matter. But historically, it's a really interesting fact that if you go back 100 years, you could have learned many, many more skills than you can now. And the things that would possibly count as skills, you know, like Max and Maya and all the rest of it that I list there, um, aren't usually thought of in that way. The Art Academy usually takes pride in de-skilling because it shows a responsibility and an interest in the present and in contemporary art.